Hi friends, Apostle Price here. This year, 2013, we are celebrating 35 years of ever-increasing faith television. We are still walking by faith. During this year, we will air some of our most popular classic series from years gone by. Remember, you have made it happen for the past 35 years. I appreciate your loyalty. Stay with us and enjoy my classic teachings. Get involved. Visit faithdome.org for more details. From Inglewood, California, ever increasing faith. Pastor and teacher Frederick K. Price. Evidence will get put you away. Evidence, evidence, do you need enough evidence? Evidence, evidence, what does your life say? Welcome to Ever Increasing Faith. Remember these words from the book of Romans, chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Well, praise God for another day and for another privilege and opportunity to share with you the living word of God. Turn in your Bibles to Romans, chapter 1. And we will read a verse of scripture that is synonymous with several scriptures that we gave you at the outset of this particular series. And uh, we will announce our title in just a moment. But we want to read this one verse because it is representative of the other verses that we gave you when we first started. We gave quite a few scripture passages which we do not have time to go into at this point. But if you will follow along as we read this one verse, it will give you an idea of the other verses because actually they were saying basically the same thing. But this verse is representative, and uh, it will give us the foundation of our lesson that we have been teaching on for the last several sessions. Now, in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, it says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by what? Faith. The just shall live by what? Now again, the word just means to be declared righteous. If you have accepted or received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, then the Heavenly Father declares you righteous. You become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So when you read this verse, Romans 1.17, and it says that the just shall live by faith, that word just literally means declared righteous. So you can put your name in there. So I could read it like this. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, those who have been declared righteous, which means Fred Price, shall live by faith. So what it's saying then is that faith is a way of living. It is a lifestyle. And uh, I can't say that too often because people do not understand that when we talk about faith, we're not talking about some kind of instant panacea for all your ills. We're not talking about some kind of a panic button that you can press and bail yourself out of some present dilemma, but that faith is a way of living. It is something that you start in and you walk in it all the days of your life. It is a lifestyle. It is a way of living. It is the life of faith, the God kind of faith. God is a faith God, and he operates by faith, and if we are going to receive the maximum benefits from the new covenant that Jesus has procured for us by his own blood, then we're going to have to do it by exercising our faith. So it means then that we need to understand what faith is, and we also need to understand what faith ain't. There are a lot of people, many people, multitudes of people, who do not understand the difference between faith and foolishness and presumption. And that's what we've been talking about in, the la in these last several sessions. Faith, foolishness, or presumption. And we've been examining everyday lifestyle situations to find out whether or not am I really exercising faith or am I operating foolishly or, I, or am I being presumptuous. 
There is such a thing as being presumptuous. There is such a thing as operating foolishly in the things of God. But there is also something called operating in faith. And so we need, as Christians, we need to know that we know that we know that we know that we are, in fact, exercising faith, that we're not acting foolishly, that we're not acting presumptuously, but that we're acting in line with God's Word. Now, in order to discuss the subject, we need to define our terms. We've talked about faith, foolishness, or presumption. So we need to be ticking along, as it were, on the same frequency, so that when I mention foolishness, you will understand what I mean by it. When I mention presumption, you will understand what I mean by it. When I mention faith, you will understand what I mean by it. In other words, we will be thinking, we will be viewing this on the same level. I won't say foolishness, and you think in one thing, I'm thinking something else. So, we want to define our terms, faith, foolishness, or presumption. Faith is what? Say it. Faith is acting on the Word of God. You say you believe the Word. Oh, yes, Brother Price, glory to God. Well, then that means you must be a doer of the Word. If you're not a doer of the Word, then you're deceiving yourself. You're fooling yourself. Faith is acting on what you believe. Well, relative to us as Christians, faith is acting on God's Word. We believe the Word of God. Is that right? Therefore, faith is acting on God's Word. If God, God's Word says a certain thing about us, then that's what it is. That's what we are. That's what we have. That's where we are. In other words, whatever the Word of God says about us, that's who we are. Now, we have to begin to act on that. Even though we may not feel like it, even though we may not look like it at the time, yet if we want it to work for us, we have to act on God's Word. So the simplest definition that I can give you of faith. Now, I realize that Hebrews 11.1 1 is the biblical, classical, scriptural definition of faith. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But to make that practical and to make it applicable to everyday living, the best way I can say it to you is that faith is, in a nutshell, faith is acting on the Word. You say you believe the Bible. Oh, yes, hallelujah, glory to God, I've always believed the Bible. Well, then that means you're going to have to act on it. You're going to have to be a doer of the Word if you want the Word to work for you. See, it's one thing just to academically believe the Bible is God's Word. Oh, yes, oh, hallelujah, I believe that to be the Bible is the Word of God. And then you set it on your coffee table or your mantelpiece for it to gather dust. You never read it. You never act on it. You never learn it. You don't know what it says, but you believe it. Oh, yes, I've always believed the Bible. That won't do you any good personally. Now, that's commendable that you believe the Bible. It's wonderful that you believe that's God's Word, but it's not going to do you any personal good in your everyday lifestyle unless you learn how to act on God's Word. And that's what faith is, acting on the Word of God. All right? Foolishness. What is foolishness? Come on, say it. Let me hear it. Foolish, dumb, stupid. All right. Here it is. As we use Webster's Dictionary, which is in use in the English language, this is where we're getting our definition, the word foolishness means exhibiting folly, deficient in understanding, without judgment or discretion, silly, unwise, stupid, idiotic, senseless, ill-advised, brainless, witless, irrational. That is the meaning of foolishness. So when we talk about foolishness, you'll understand what we're talking about. Listen to it again. Foolishness is exhibiting folly, deficient in understanding, without judgment or discretion, silly, unwise, stupid, idiotic, senseless, ill-advised, brainless, witless, irrational. That's a person who acts foolishly. 
All right, presumption. Again, we'll use Webster's Dictionary as our point of reference. The word presumption means to take for granted or suppose to be true or entitled to believe that something is so without any examination or without any proof. On the strength of probability, maybe so. Well, it could be. Well, it might be. To take for granted, to infer, to suppose, to assume that a thing is true without having any evidence, without examining the situation, just assuming that it's true. That's presumption. Whenever you're acting in presumption, that's how you're acting. You're acting without any degree of proof, without having examined anything. You're just acting on it because you think, well, it might work. It, maybe it's true. Maybe yes, maybe no. I'm going to do it anyway. That's presumption. Now, we want to talk about faith, foolishness, or presumption. All right, we've already talked about finances. We've talked about buying homes. We've talked about buying furniture and buying cars. We've talked about insurance. Is it faith to disregard your insurance and get rid of all your insurance policies? Does that mean you're operating in faith because you cut yourself loose from insurance? Or does it mean that you're not operating in faith because you do have insurance? You know, automobile insurance, life insurance, medical insurance. I mean, is, does that mean I'm in faith because I get rid of all my policies? Some people think that it is. I know ministers, I know people who actually think that because they get rid of their insurance policies, they automatically are operating in faith. And they also think that if you have insurance, that you're not operating in faith. And we pointed out from the Word that insurance is irrelevant and immaterial unless you put your faith in it. Now, if you put your faith in life insurance to keep you alive, you're in trouble. If you put your faith in automobile insurance to keep you from having a wreck, you're in trouble. If you put your faith in medical insurance to keep you from getting sick, you're in trouble. But to have or not to have life insurance is irrelevant and immaterial. It doesn't mean that you do have faith because you don't have insurance policies. It doesn't mean that you don't have faith because you do have insurance. It doesn't make any difference. It's a matter of where's your trust. If your trust is in the insurance, then that's where your faith is. And then your faith is not in the Word of God, so you're going to be operating in foolishness and presumption. But if your faith is in the Word of God, whether you have insurance or don't have insurance is irrelevant and immaterial. Now, when the issue arises where you can live in a world, you're on a desert island all by yourself, no other humans to interact with, no animals to cross your path, then you can just drive your little old car all over that island. You'll never have a wreck. So there's no possibility of you having to have any insurance. It wouldn't make any difference if you ran into a tree and totaled your car. It wouldn't, no problem. You wouldn't need public liability insurance. See what I mean? If you didn't have any family, nobody uh, that's depending upon you, and you're just going to believe God for yourself, and you're on that desert island all alone, maybe you don't need any insurance, medical insurance, because you're just going to stand on your own. But when you have other people to contend with, you have to take them into consideration, because everybody else on the road may not be acting right. Hmm? See? Everybody on the road may not be acting right, and the insurance is not going to keep you from having a wreck, but it sure can close the door on the devil from them folks suing you and taking away from you everything that you have. So insurance is irrelevant and immaterial. Don't get locked into thinking that because you have insurance, that means you don't have faith. Don't think that because you don't have insurance that that automatically means that you have faith. It may be so. It may not be so. The thing that is important is, are you acting on God's Word? And I don't find anything in the Word of God where it said, don't have insurance. So if you want to have it, fine. If you don't want to have it, fine. But I don't think that you or me or anybody else has a right to impose this off on somebody else. And it's not right for me to say to this man, brother, if you got insurance, you are definitely not operating in faith. I am not God. I am not the judge. And I have no right to say that to him to put him in bondage. I can't say to him, look, I don't have any insurance. You do. So that means you're not operating in faith and I am. See, that's putting this man in bondage. He has some respect for me as being a spiritual leader, as being his pastor. So he may be tempted to try to follow my lead. And so he goes home and he cancels all of his insurance policies. 
Well, maybe his faith is not operating on the same level that mine is. Maybe I've been in this a little bit longer than he has. Maybe I've developed my faith to an extent where my faith is working for me on a very regular basis, and it's able to keep me from getting into problems. But his faith is not there yet. He cancels his insurance policy, goes right out and gets in a wreck. He's in trouble. Because I tell you what, you scrape fenders today, brother, and them folks want to sue you. And I mean, they don't want to just recover the damage on your car. They want to get rich quick on you. They're going to sue you for $100,000 or more if they can get it. Follow what I mean? So insurance is irrelevant and immaterial. Don't just think because you have it that you don't have faith. Don't think that because you don't have insurance that you do have faith. You may not have any insurance, and you may be operating in foolishness, yea, even in presumption. All right. Let's talk today about healing, divine healing, because a lot of people have misconceptions about healing. And there are some people that think that, well, if, you know, if you get prayed for, well, as soon as you get prayed for, throw your glasses away, rip out your hearing aid, get rid of your crutch, throw your wheelchair away, get rid of your insulin, get rid of your heart medicine, and all the other medicines you may be taking. And they say that, well, if you have faith, brother, you can't have any medication. Well, let me ask you a question. What does taking medicine have to do with you being healed? I mean, you really think about it. What does taking medicine have to do with you being healed? Really, it doesn't have anything to do with it. Nothing. And actually, in studying the Bible, I have not found anywhere where it has shown me that taking medication is opposed to divine healing. In fact, it seems to me that doctors and medicine and operations and all that the hospitals and all that the nurses can do, it seems to me that they're actually working in line with God because they're trying to help people to get better. Isn't that right? I mean, they're trying to help people to get well. Isn't that right? I mean, the purpose of medication is to try to alleviate pain and alleviate the suffering that goes along with it to try to get you better. Is that right? So actually, to take medicine does not mean that it's a lack of faith. Now, it might be. It, it could be a lack of faith. But just automatically, you can't say that it is just because somebody takes medication. And that's a danger in dealing with divine healing, especially with faith healing, is that people get prayed for, and then they go and throw their glasses away. I never will forget when we first moved into this area of, of divine healing. And uh, we began to hear the Word on it. I began to teach on it, began to study the Word on it. And there were some of the girls in our group that wore glasses. And I never will forget that first night we started talking about healing. I mean, they all took their glasses off, threw them on the floor, and jumped on them. <laughs> smashed them up, see? They, gonna, they, they heal now, see? They're healed. Praise God, I'm acting on the Word. I'm healed. Then the rest of the evening, it was, where's the door? <laughs> where's the door? Well, the very fact that they couldn't see should have indicated that you must not be healed yet because if you were healed, you wouldn't need the glasses. See? And they didn't understand the difference between faith. See, the Bible says that faith is the evidence, not the fact that you don't wear glasses. Did you get that? See, Hebrews 11:1 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Now faith is the evidence. Faith is the evidence. Faith is the evidence. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. Not the fact that you don't wear glasses. That's not the evidence. Faith is the evidence. We had a celebrated case some years ago here in California where somebody went and family took a child and the preacher prayed for the child and said, the child is healed. And so the parents went home and took away the insulin. Child had diabetes. The child began to go into insulin shock. And he began to say, give me my medicine. Give me my medicine. Give me my medicine. He could feel something was wrong. Something was going down that just wasn't right. And the parents said, oh, no, you're healed, you're healed, you're healed. And the child died. Died. Well, now, who got the glory out of that? God didn't. God wasn't glorified in that. And the very fact that his body went into shock indicated that he wasn't healed, not as a physical fact. You see, there is a difference, and I, I'm absolutely amazed at 
and how difficult it appears for people to grasp the difference between a faith fact and a physical fact. It's amazing to me how people cannot make the distinction between a faith fact and a physical fact. A physical fact is something that you have manifested in your body. A faith fact is something that's manifested in God's Word. Anything that's in this Bible that you take and believe, you have that at that moment as a faith fact. And faith becomes your evidence. Anything that you have in your body, you have that as a physical fact. Now, when you deal with healing, it is the faith fact that produces the physical fact. Say that. It is the faith fact that produces the physical fact. You see, you have the faith fact first, then you have the physical fact that follows it. Now, where a lot of people miss it with divine healing. You see, I better say this. A lot of people, in fact, you may be listening and watching me right now, and because of the church that you go to, you may not believe in divine healing for today. You may say like many do, healing went out with the early church. It did. Were you there to see what went out? How do you know it went out? Maybe something else was put in. See? But because you've been taught that, you heard that in your church, you believe it. You didn't believe it from the Bible because it doesn't say that in the Bible. You didn't get it out of the Bible. You got it out of your church. Amen. You might as well say that's where you got it out of your church, from your preacher. You did not get it out of the Bible because the Bible never says that it went out. It's still in. Well, Brother Francis, if healing's for us today, how come God doesn't heal everybody? Well, let me ask you this question. Do you think salvation is for everybody today? Oh, yes, hallelujah, it's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Well, then tell me how come folks are dying and going to hell? Well, Brother Price, that's easy to understand. They're not all believing and accepting Jesus as their Savior. Go to the head of the class. You make a triple A on that subject. Now, just like that's true, so is it true that everybody does not accept Jesus as their healer. And because they don't, that's why the healing power of God cannot be ministered to them. You see, their condition, because all their lives, since they've been in church, all they've ever heard, get saved, get saved, get saved, get saved, get saved, get saved, come to the altar, come to the altar, get saved, Get saved, and that's all right. The point I'm making, though, is that like Pavlov's dog, you've been conditioned to the salvation aspect of the gospel. So you accept that going away, and you don't have any argument about that. You don't have any problem about that. When it says somebody died and went to hell, you don't say, well, I guess it's not God's will for everybody to be saved because if it was God's will for everybody to be saved, then everybody would get saved. So since somebody died and went to hell, it must not be God's will for everybody to get saved. You don't say that, do you? You have no problem with that, do you? No, you know why? Because you've been conditioned by the fact that you've heard the Word of God on it for so many years that you know that salvation is based on you accepting Christ as your Savior. And if you don't accept Him, there's no way you can get saved. So you accept that, see? Well, you have to accept Jesus as your healer. See? Now, when you get conditioned to accepting Jesus as your healer, just like you accept him as your Savior, you start getting healed just like you got saved. Same thing, same principle. It works the same way, you see? Now, there are basically two kinds of healings, two basic categories of healing. One is healings that are initiated by God himself. And they are usually referred to as miracle healings or gifts of healings. I mean, God just sovereignly, zap, does something. Okay? The other kind or the other classification of healing is what I like to refer to as faith healing, which simply means that the people involved receive their healing by exercising their faith by exercising the faith in God's Word. In other words, God's Word is the channel. Now, whenever gifts of healings operate or miracle healings, and they do, but even those kind of things are predicated on people expecting them to work. The reason that 
in many congregations you don't have any supernatural manifestations is because the people don't believe in it. And so what they do is they exude from themselves a negative influence into the atmosphere. And that negative influence negates or short circuits the power of God and His power can't function or operate. See, God can't just do things because He's God. Now, don't touch that dial. Don't touch that dial. I know that's heavy for you. Some folks can't understand it. Wow, what? God can do anything. No, He can't. No, He can't do anything. Now, He can do everything that He said He'll do, but He can't do anything. Well, I don't understand that. That's because you don't understand the Bible. That's exactly why we're coming there right now telling you about this, because we knew you didn't understand this. So that's why we're here to help you out, see? See? The Bible very clearly says that it is impossible for God to lie. Amen. How many of you have ever read that? You know that's true. Well, isn't that something God can't do? Huh? I said, isn't that something God can't do? Yes. That means he can't lie. Well, don't say then God can do anything. He can't lie. So that's something that he can't do. Huh? The Bible also says that God is not the author of confusion. So that means that if there's any confusion around, God didn't start it. That's something God can't do. He can't start confusion because he's not the author of confusion. Huh? So, just to glibly say, oh, God can do anything. No, he can't. His power can be limited by our exercise of faith by our coming together as a body expecting God to do something. If we don't expect him to do something, then that curtails his power. That hinders him from doing it. See? I used to think that. I used to, in fact, I used to think that God was prejudiced. Really. I used to think God was white. I did. I really did. I'm not trying to be funny because all that I ever heard within the context of the Christian church, it left me to believe that I was inferior and that white folks were superior, therefore God must be white. And then it seemed like the white churches were the ones that were blessed. You know what I mean? Materially and financially. I mean, black little rinky-dink churches, those storefront churches. and I mean, you hardly ever see a white storefront church. Just don't see very many of them, comparatively speaking. Are you following what I'm saying? And so because of the society that I've been in for many years, I, I thought God was prejudiced. I said, he won't do anything like that for us, see? And then I'd read about people like, uh, well, I don't know whether, I, I don't know if I'm going to get in trouble if I mention somebody's name. I, I don't know, man, this thing is something, you know, you never know what you're going to do. I don't think it's bad if you mention somebody in a good light. There's no problem if you mention somebody in a good light, is it? Is, 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 well, let's see. Well, anyway. <laughs> well, I, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and take a chance on this. But, but I used to hear about Oral Roberts, and I used to hear about his healing meetings. In fact, I remember years ago, I used to turn it on on television. He came on TV. I was back in, in, the, in the days of the black and white color, uh, black and white sets, and there wasn't very much color. And his programs at that time were not in color. It used to be his tent revival meeting. Well, I didn't know anything about divine healing. To me, it was just kind of like a, some kind of a novelty, you know. But I turned the, the programs on, and man, I'd see all these people, and he'd lay hands on them, and, and these people were healed. And boy, I said, wow, that's really something. I never saw nothing like that happen in black churches, see. Then, then I heard about Catherine Kuhlman, and then I, I would see the great miracle services that she would have. And I said, gee, you know, God, he, you know, he, he might, well, I can understand if God's white, naturally he's going to bless his own, his own people <laughs> more, you know. And that, I mean, that's reasonable, you know. And uh, then when I came into the knowledge of the Word, I found out that, that, that God wasn't blessing too many white folks, really. It just seemed like it because they were in prominent positions, but there's just a handful of them that was getting something. And when I started traveling around, I found out that people are just alike everywhere, whether they're black, white, brown, red, or yellow. <laughs> just alike. <laughs> and, and I found out that God was not prejudiced. I found out that God would do for me what he'd do for anybody else, but there were conditions that had to be met. 
See? Now, sometimes you can meet the conditions of God without knowing that you're meeting the condition and produce result, but you don't know what you did to produce it. But stuff just works, see? You might have been doing the right thing and didn't know that you were doing the right thing. But, brother, I tell you what, you can find out how to do the right thing and you can program the machine, bless God, so it'll do the same thing all the time and produce the same kind of results all the time. God is no respecter of persons. This ministry attests to the fact that God is no respecter of persons. But you've got to do it God's way. You've got to go whole hog or nothing at all. Follow what I'm saying? And when you find out that, that, that the power of God is controlled by the faith of the congregation, the faith of the individual person, then you can understand why it's so necessary to get in line with the Word to create the kind of atmosphere, the kind of channel that the power of God can flow in. Now, let me give you an illustration to prove to you that the faith of men, either as individuals or corporately like in a body like this, I'll show you and prove to you from the Bible that whether that atmosphere is an atmosphere of faith or an atmosphere of unbelief can control the power of the living God. Turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 6. The uh, Spirit of God is leading me in a little different way. Uh, <laughs> I'm supposed to be dealing with another aspect, but I'm, I'm impressed to go this way relative to divine healing, but I think that'll be ble a blessing to you. Because <clears throat> we're talking about faith, foolishness, or presumption, and we're talking about the, the aspect of using medication, you know, relative to, to healing. In other words, if I, if I believe that I'm healed, is it a lack of faith to take medication? See what I mean? Is it a lack of faith to seek medical help? And... Uh, if I do seek medical help, that means that I'm not exercising faith. If I don't seek medical help, that means I'm actually on a high level of faith. But it ain't necessarily so, as the song says. And we'll see that in just a moment. Now, here in the sixth chapter of the Gospel of Mark, it says, And he went out from thence and came into his own country, and his disciples follow him. Now, as you can guess, this is talking about Jesus. Verse 2. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works, underline that, mighty works. See, they acknowledged that the man was doing mighty works. They said, Mighty works are wrought by his hands. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and of Judah and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin and in his own house. And he could there do no mighty work save or accept that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Now, their unbelief stopped the supernatural power of God in the city of Nazareth. And I'm here to tell you that it'll stop it in Los Angeles, San Francisco, New York, Moscow, London, you name it. That same kind of unbelief will stop the power of God. See, now you know yourself. If there's any place on the face of the earth where you want to look good is in your own hometown, among your own relatives. Isn't that right? I mean, when something good happens to you, the first folks you want to know about it are the home folks. You want them to be proud of you. Isn't that right? I mean, you want to go home, let mom and daddy, and let sisters and brothers and all the relatives and the neighbors, you want them to know you succeeded. You made it big. Huh? And so when Jesus came to Nazareth, he came there to work supernatural works and they wouldn't let him. They would not let him do it. See, notice verse 5. It didn't say, and he would there do no mighty works. It didn't say that he would not. It said he could not. Not there. Not there he couldn't. Why? Because of their unbelief. They wouldn't let him. So, when there is a high level of expectancy, when there's a high level of belief, then that creates a fertile atmosphere in which the power of God can be ignited to bring forth supernatural manifestations. 
but it takes the faith of the people. But how do the people get up there on that level of faith? By being taught the Word of God. Look at verse 6. And he marveled because of their unbelief, and he went around about the villages, what? Teaching. Teaching, Teaching is the cure for unbelief. That's why we're teaching the Word. And it creates a level of faith in the atmosphere where the power of God can be manifested. All right, now that's what you call the manifestation of miracle healings or gifts of healings. Now, what we're primarily interested in is faith healing. Now, faith healing simply means a person receiving their healing by exercising their faith, by taking a stand on the Word of God. See, the Word of God says in Matthew 8, 17, as an example, Matthew 8, 17, it says, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying himself, Jesus, took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. All right? If he took our infirmities and if he bore our sicknesses, then he must not want me to have those sicknesses. Hmm? Because if he wanted me to have them, then that means that they've been paid for twice. Hmm? Did you get that? You get what I'm saying? So the Bible says that himself took my infirmities and he bore my sicknesses. If that's true, then that means he doesn't want me to be sick. So what I have to do is say, all right, I'm going to believe the Word of God. I take my stand on the Word of God and I claim my healing according to the Word of God. I now believe that I am healed. Now that's a, I'm making a confession of faith. Why? Because the Word said it. I'm acting on the Word, so I'm making an action of faith. Now, my body may still feel sick. That's where a lot of people can't, they, they, they just get all confused when it comes to faith healing. See, they think, well, I prayed, I, I don't feel no better. I must not be healed. But what they fail to realize is that faith has to be their evidence and not their bodies. Hmm? And so, I mean, when you plant a seed in the ground and you cover the seed up, do you immediately begin to say, well, my God, I don't guess I'm going to ever have harvest. That seed's not going to do nothing. No, you got enough sense to know that it takes time for that seed to germinate. It takes time for that seed to sprout. It takes time for that seed to grow up. And so every day in, in faith, I mean in absolute confidence in faith, here you come with the water can. You haven't seen nothing yet, nothing there but dirt, nothing but ground. But what? You planted that seed. And you know that it, within the context of that seed is life. And you know that a plant is inside that seed. But you know you've got to water it, and you know that you have to leave it in contact with the ground. So you don't come out there every day saying, well, I guess I ain't going to get no harvest because I don't see no plant. Huh? It's the same principle. When you, when you exercise your faith on the Word of God to believe that you receive your healing, it's exactly like planting a seed in the ground. And the way you water it is with the confession of your mouth. Every time you say, praise God, I believe that I'm healed, you just put a little more water on the seed. Hmm? See? So every day you say, praise God, I believe I'm healed. Praise God, I believe I'm healed. Praise the Lord, I believe I'm healed, according to the Word. See, I say, I praise God, I believe that I'm healed. See, I'm not saying that I am healed because I'm not. If I was, I wouldn't have to believe it. Huh? Did you get that? That blew right by some of you. You went, huh? Hmm? See, the very fact that I say I believe that I'm healed, I still may have symptoms in my body. I still may have pain. The tumor may still be there in terms of me actually being able to feel it. See what I mean? So my confession has to be based on the Word of God. I believe that I'm healed. Why do you believe it? Because the Bible says with Jesus' stripes, I was healed. I believe what the Bible says. So therefore, I have to believe that I'm healed. Now, it's by believing that I'm healed and confessing the same that causes it to come to pass. In the meantime, you may still need the glasses. Huh? In the meantime, you may still need the insulin. In the meantime, you may still need the glycerin for your heart. In the meantime, you may still need the crutch. In the meantime, you may still need the wheelchair. Because what? You're not healed yet as a physical fact. You have it as a faith fact based on the Word of God. God's Word is your evidence, not your body. So, whether you wear glasses or not is irrelevant and immaterial unless you put your faith in the glasses. Now, if you put your faith in the glasses to heal your eyes 
and you take your glasses off and break them up and throw them away, well, then you can see what's happened. You've thrown away your faith. Do you follow what I'm saying? But if your faith is in the Word of God, then it doesn't make any difference whether you wear the glasses or don't wear the glasses. Why? Because wearing glasses does not heal bad eyes anyhow. If wearing glasses healed bad eyes, you wouldn't have to pray. Just wear the glasses. All right, let me give you an illustration. How many of you have been wearing glasses for at least 15 years? No? Huh? 15 years. <laughs> by wearing those glasses, are your eyes getting better? Just by wearing those glasses over the last 15 years, have your eyes been getting stronger and stronger and better and better? And the optometrist said, well, it just will be a few more days, praise God, just a few more days, and your eyes will be perfectly all right, and we can throw the glasses away. I'm, now, I'm, I'm going to prophesy now, show you how what great word of knowledge revelation that I have. I'm going to prophesy. I don't even know your optometrist. I don't even know your eye doctor, but I'm going to prophesy. I'm going to say to you what the doctor said. I wasn't even there. I don't even know what the doctor said in, in terms of being there physically, but I'm going to prophesy. Hallelujah, I'm going to prophesy, and I'm going to tell you what your doctor said. He said, we're going to have to change the prescription. We're going to have to make, we're going to have to give you a little stronger prescription. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, uh, see that? Just call me Prophet Price. No, Be, that's what happens. See, your eyes don't get stronger, they get weaker. So then the point is, wearing glasses is irrelevant and immaterial. Doesn't make any difference. Whether you wear them or don't wear them, because wearing them is not going to heal your eyes. And I tell you what, not wearing them sure ain't going to heal them. <laughs> See what I mean? It's faith, your faith that will do the healing. But now in the meantime, while the seed is growing in the ground, what you going to do? Starve while you waiting for the harvest? No, go to the grocery store and buy you some other food until the seeds come up. Now, you don't think anything wrong with that, do you? You're going to plant a seed on Monday and you're just going to sit there, water it on Monday, water it on Tuesday, and you're just going to sit there and wait for the seed. Well, I, I know I got me some cabbages planted here and <laughs> I got me some carrots over there and there's some green beans over there and I sure am getting hungry though. I don't know when that seed's going to come up. Put a little more water on it. I've just been waiting here. I walked by one day, and there you are lying on the ground. <laughs> Frank, what you doing on the ground? Get up. Talk to me. He said, oh, friend, I'm so hungry. <laughs> well, why don't you eat something? Well, the seeds haven't come up yet. <laughs> no. He goes to the store and buys him some food. Now, when the harvest starts coming in, he don't have to go to the store no more. <laughs> he can eat right out of his own yard. But until then, you wouldn't say he's operating with no faith because he goes to the market and buys him some food. In fact, you'd say he's pretty smart. All right, use the same analogy relative to healing. Here she is. She prays for the healing of her eyes. The Bible says that with Jesus striped, she was healed. So she believes that. She takes that on by faith. And she says, according to the word of God, himself took my infirmities and bore my sicknesses. Therefore, I believe that I'm healed. The word of God becomes my evidence. Faith is the evidence, not the fact that I don't wear glasses. Now, she takes her glasses off and she can't see any better. Well, that tells her right there that the eyes have not manifested yet. The healing's not manifested. Well, she's still got to see in the meantime, just like he had to eat in the meantime. So she puts her glasses on. And every time she puts her glasses on, she says, praise God, I believe I'm healed. Now, see, there's no inconsistency in that. Now, here's what would be inconsistent. Let's say that I pray for her. I lay hands on her and I pray for her. The power of God comes on her, zap, knocks her out flat on her back under the power of God. When she rises up, she takes her glasses off and her eyes are perfectly clear. She can see everything just as clear as a baby. I mean, there's nothing thing in the world wrong with her vision. Perfect. Now, if she took her glasses and put them back on and kept on wearing them now, then she would be denying the healing. She would be opening the door for the enemy to put the condition right back on her and she would lose the healing. You know why? Because she already had it as a physical fact. Huh? And the very fact that her eyes were healed let her know that she didn't have to believe it anymore. See, anything you already have physically manifested to you you don't have to believe it. All right, careful now, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to think about this. Get yourself set, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm not trying to trick you, I'm trying to illustrate the truth. 
How many of you believe without any doubt? You have no doubt about it at all. You are absolutely, positively, unequivocally, thoroughly convinced of the fact that I, Frederick K. Price, pastor of Crenshaw Christian Center, is now standing before you ministering the word to you. I want you to be honest about it. How many of you believe that that's true? Raise your hand. Come on, get your hand up. Quick, quick, quick. Put your hand up. Get your hand up. You believe it? Do you believe it? You believe it? Ah, you got it. You, you, she got it. See that? See, you got it, didn't you? Ah, see, boy, I tell you, it's beautiful to see the revelation of the Word of God come. See, she got it. See? No, you don't believe that. You know that. Here I am in living color. Huh? You believe I'm standing here now? You know it. See, the point I'm making, anything that you already have as a physically manifested fact, you don't have to believe it. You know it. You only have to use your faith when you don't have it yet as a physical fact, and it is your faith that produces the physical fact. So in the meantime, you might need to wear the glasses. And every time you put them on, you say, praise God, I believe that I am healed. Nothing inconsistent about that whatsoever. Now, see, if I were actually physically healed, and I put the glasses back on, I would be denying the healing, and I would lose it. How many of you understand that? But see, I don't have it yet, because if I had it yet, already rather, as a physical fact, I wouldn't even need the glasses. Huh? So don't get locked into thinking, well, praise God, I believe I'm healed. Rip off your glasses and throw them away. Get rid of the insulin. Now, there was a, a, a situation where Two men heard this kind of teaching. One was an elderly man, and the other was a younger man. And they heard this kind of teaching. Both of them had diabetes. Both of them used insulin. And the young man said, Praise the Lord! Hallelujah! Glory to God! I see what the Word says. Now listen to me. I see what the Word said. And he got all of his stuff together, his insulin and all that, and his needles and all that, and he said, I'm throwing this stuff away. I don't need it anymore. I'm going to trust God or die. I'm going to trust God or die. He's exercising his faith. Well, he went into insulin shock not too long after that and died. It's a true story, and he died. Now, who got any glory out of that? The devil, God sure didn't get any. Now, the older man, having a little more wisdom, he, he grasped the understanding of the confession of faith. He, he grasped the understanding of the faith fact as opposed to the physical fact. And so, every day, he'd take his insulin and he'd say, Father, I want to thank you. I believe that I am healed. See, he never said he was healed. He said, I believe that I am. Why do you believe that? Because God said that I am. But I believe what God said, so I believe that I am. Every day he did that. Some while later, he was driving down the street in his car. Being an older man, he, he wore glasses. And uh, he had the window down on the driver's side. And as he was driving along, a bee flew in the car through the window. Flew in up behind his glasses, like back in here. And, and, you know, and when he saw it, he's, he, you know, he's trying to bat this thing out of his eye, and he, he got all involved in that, lost control of the car, and the car swerved across the street up on the, the sidewalk, hit a telephone pole, and bang, the, the steering wheel hit him in the chest. Well, they took him, took him out of the car. He seemed to be all right, but they suggested that he better go to the doctor. So he went to his regular doctor, and he told the doctor what happened, and so the doctor took him in and examined him and everything, took x-rays and all that, and then he said to him, when you get dressed, come on back in to the office. So finally he came back in the office, and uh, the doctor showed him on the x-rays and said, well, you're all right. There are no broken bones. You're just going to be bruised up there. You'll be a little bit sore for a while. 
and, uh, but don't worry about it. There's nothing, nothing wrong, no bruised bones or anything, I mean, no broken bones or anything like that. He said, by the way, are you still taking that insulin? And he said, oh, yeah, I take it regularly. And, uh, you know, as a habit. And the doctor said, well, I just wanted to inform you that you don't need to take it any longer because I, while, you, while I had you here, I gave you a thorough and complete examination, and I, I can't detect any sugar diabetes in your body at all. You don't need it anymore. Don't take it. Now, that, that's a true story. And uh, now, what's, now, now, what was better? I'm going to trust God or die <laughs> or to go ahead and take the insulin and make the confession of faith. See, that's a faith confession. Not a physical fact confession, but a faith confession. There's another story. This is also a true story about a young lady. She heard this message, message of faith and power, and so she wanted to believe God for her, for her sight. Her eyes were very bad. If she took her glasses off, she could hardly see her hand in front of her face. Well, she heard this message, and somehow she got it in her mind, just like some people do, that if I'm going to exercise faith, and I've got to throw my glasses away, I've got to get rid of all the medication, you know, I've got to get rid of all that to prove that I have faith. And actually what people don't realize is they're really not exercising faith in the Word of God. Listen to this very carefully. They really don't realize they're not really exercising faith in the Word of God. What they're really exercising faith in is not taking medicine. Did you get that? Their faith is really not in God's Word. Their faith is in not taking medication, not wearing glasses, not taking insulin. Why? Because they've thrown it away. And they're thinking, well, because I don't wear the glasses and I don't take the medication, that's going to heal me you'll end up dying. Well, anyway, this girl got this idea that she's supposed to take her glasses off, so she took her glasses off. Fortunately, she didn't break them up, but she just stopped wearing them. Every day she had to take her children to school, and uh, where she lived and where the school was, she had to drive on a freeway, on an expressway that had a median right in the middle of it. And uh, <laughs> every day she'd get on that freeway, and to show you how bad this girl's eyes were, from the center lane, she couldn't even see the median in the middle of the highway. And it terrified her, you know what I'm saying? But somehow she got it in her mind that she had to do that to prove that she was healed, see? And so she, and finally, this, this minister that she had heard minister along these lines of, of, of faith was in another place nearby, and she came and asked him the question. And he told her, well, said, well don't, don't, don't take your glasses off. Go ahead and put your glasses on when you need to drive or whenever you need to read or whatever you're doing. And every time you put them on, just say, I believe that I'm healed. I believe that I'm healed. I believe that I'm healed. See, you're making a confession of faith based on the Word of God. Now, all the glasses are doing is permitting your eyes to function normally until the healing takes place. As soon as the healing takes place, you'll be the first one to know about it because you won't be able to see out of the glasses. And so she did that. And her own testimony was that for six months, she kept making that confession. I believe that I'm healed. 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 For six long months, and she said one day she got up and, you know, she was in a habit of doing this and she reached to the nightstand by her bed and put her glasses on and couldn't even see the floor. <laughs> couldn't see anything. Say, what in the world is wrong? And she took her glasses off and all of a sudden she realized her eyes were perfect and she didn't have to wear glasses anymore. She's healed. <laughs> well, that's better than trusting God and dying, huh? See? So don't think that because you throw away your medicine that that means that you're not healed or that you're not exercising faith. I say this to you. If you need to wear your glasses, wear them. If you can do without them during a course of the day, then take them off and then while you're not wearing them, make your confession that much stronger at that period of time, see? But don't get locked into this idea of thinking that because I wear the glasses or take the medicine, that means automatically that I'm not exercising faith. And don't get locked into the idea that because I throw them all away and I don't take the medicine and I don't wear the glasses, that automatically I'm, well, either way, I'm not, wear, I'm not in faith or I am in faith. It doesn't make any difference. Wearing the glasses does not mean that you're not in faith. Not wearing the glasses does not mean automatically that you're in faith. It may or it may not. It's not automatic. It depends on the individual person. Now, I remember I prayed for a lady myself. This is my own personal situation. I was praying for a lady in a meeting, and she had a, um, uh, well, the Holy Spirit, by the word of knowledge, impressed me that, that somebody had a, uh, something wrong with their back. And so this lady stood up, and I said, I, Sister, I perceive that by the Holy Spirit that one of your legs is shorter than the other. And what's happened is it has thrown your body out of balance, and over a period of years, it's caused your body to be put into a strained position 
because your body had to compensate for being off balance. So I had her come down, I had her, we had her sit in a chair, and sure enough, one of her legs was, was uh, shorter than the other one. So I commanded the leg to grow out in the name of Jesus, and the leg just grew right out. Both legs were the same length, and all of her pain in her back just left instantly. And she bent over and touched her toes, and she was perfectly fine. Well, then I laid hands on her and just prayed for her that she'd be healed from the top of her head to the soles of her feet. Well, I, I, I noticed that she had glasses on, but she never said anything about it, and I didn't say anything about it. I just went on and prayed. Well, some weeks later, I was back at this same church ministering. And uh, when we got down to the healing service, uh, this lady raised her hand and said, may I give a testimony? And I said, well, certainly. So she got up, and this is the testimony that she gave. She said, you remember I came here and, and you ministered to me about having a, a bad back and a short leg? I said, oh, yes, I remember. And so she uh, told that part of it and how we prayed and the leg grew out and her back was healed. And then she said, well... You may not have remembered, but I was wearing glasses when I came there. And uh, a few days after you prayed for me, I was at home and I put my glasses on as I regularly do, and I couldn't see. It was blurry. I couldn't see out of my glasses. And I couldn't figure out what in the world was wrong because I had just recently had this prescription chain and paid a lot of money for these new glasses, and all of a sudden I couldn't see out of them. So I went back to my eye doctor to see what was wrong. And my eye doctor examined me, and he said, well, no wonder you can't see out of these glasses. All the astigmatism that you've carried for years all disappeared. It's all gone. You don't need your glasses anymore. Huh? Follow what I'm saying? Praise the Lord. Praise God. Now, what happened? See, faith healing is like planting seed. You don't plant at 1 o'clock on Monday morning and get a harvest at one minute after one on Monday morning. It doesn't work that way. You've got to leave that seed in contact with good ground long enough to allow it to germinate and grow. Faith healing is like planting seed. So don't get locked in and don't let anybody put you in bondage and make you think that you are not exercising faith because you take medication or because you have a medical plan or because you wear glasses or because you do whatever. If you're making your confession of faith based on God's Word, you stand on that Word. If you need the medicine, praise God, take it, because that medicine is not in opposition to divine healing. It's trying to help you. It's treating the symptoms, true enough, but when your faith gets a hold, bless God, it'll knock out the cause in the name of Jesus. And you know what? My time is gone again. Praise the Lord. Listen, I'm not finished with this message, so stay right where you are, and the announcer will tell you some very important information about the message that you have just heard. Remember that these telecasts are made possible by the continued free will offerings of the people. Remember also these words from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight. This program is now available to you on CD or DVD to share with your family and friends. CD copies are available for your love gift of any amount. DVD copies are available for your love gift of $15 or more for the ongoing support of this ministry. Call the number on your screen or write to Apostle Frederick K.C. Price, Post Office Box 90,000, Los Angeles, California, 90009. Indicate the number you see on your screen and join us again on the ever-increasing Faith Network, bringing to you the power of faith to transform your life.